attending on this beautiful day in Eugene. I think we all know that it never rains at the Clark Schrager Gallery, the Schrager Clark Gallery. There's a little pun in that for those of you who are football fans. We are especially pleased today uh, to have Eric Sandgren as our guest and our speaker. I think many of you know Eric is one of the Northwest's finest painters and printmakers whose work has been shown here and in many other galleries around the West Coast and in the country. He's in a number of important uh, collections and uh, that part of Eric's well known. You might not know that Eric is also a full-time teacher of art. He's taught at uh, Grace Harbor College in Aberdeen for a number of years. I think maybe you're not full-time any longer. You're beginning to wind down. But he is also a one-man art department there, so he teaches a number of studio programs in that community, and, that, and those students are extraordinarily fortunate to have him. And you know, it's interesting, this combination of artist and teacher is, uh, those are two difficult roles to manage together. Uh, Eric has done it very successfully for a number of years. David McCosh did it as well, and he struggled with it quite a bit. In the 1930s, when he started out, at the University of Oregon. Class sizes were very small, and he kept up his active painting career that he'd started in Chicago when things were going great. And then in the 40s, things began to slow down for him. His work sort of uh, stalled in some respects. And after the war, with the big influx of students, teaching became a much greater responsibility. Bigger classes, more of them, and he really struggled with keeping the balance between teaching and making art. And you, if you remember, a few Makash shows ago, we focused on the breakthrough period for him in 1950, when he took a sabbatical, his very first sabbatical, and went to Cohasset Beach in Washington, right there where uh, Eric has lived and worked for a number of years. And he was struggling with the frustration of, um, you know, his trying to juggle these two careers, his art not going where he hoped it to be, so he decided to go right back to the basics of painting and drawing, and he did drawings like this one here, where he'd pick up some stuff on the beach and dip it into ink and just react to the landscape in front of him. And it rejuvenated his work, and it led to these things that we see all around us today, the most distinctive and creative work, I think, that Makash did. So, you know, one of the great things, I think, about teaching what you do is it requires you to explain it to people who are learning it, and that's very challenging. I taught for a number of years in my profession, law, and when you have students asking you to explain to them the most basic things, you have to really figure them out and find a way to say them that is intelligible and that contributes to the learning process. And for me, the most valuable part of teaching was all that I learned in doing it. So we're very grateful to have Eric here. He's going to speak about the common ground that uh, these painters share, and in particular, the common ground that Makash and Nelson Sandrick uh, share, uh, and some of the distinctions between them as well. And I'm really looking forward to what he has to say, so please let's welcome Eric Sandrick. As Roger said, I've been teaching so long, I'm used to boring people for 50 minutes rather than entertaining you for 20. So <laughs> I'll see what I can do, and I can judge from your restlessness since this is a stand-up uh, since this is a stand-up thing. But first of all, you know, thanks for being for uh, inviting me to this and being part of this this whole thing. It's wonderful to see the show. I saw part of it on DVD, but the digital world gives you the illusion that you're really seeing images in a way that uh, really doesn't match the experience of looking at real paintings. Real paintings have a scale, they exist in space, they're layered in a way that digital imagery is not. So, um, so what I'd like to do is, uh, I've given this a good deal of thought. Mark, we had a wonderful uh, uh, two days earlier this week where some of us painted with uh, Mark and Kay. And it was just, uh, you know, we didn't talk that much, it, except while the model was resting, because we were so involved in our own work. But uh, when we did speak, it was about uh, the, under the influence of this show that Roger has curated. Uh, it was about Makash, about Makash's palette, uh, so approaches to teaching, uh, and all that. It was, it was, so our experience was really informed by, by this one. 
And I think uh, both Dave and Nelson would have been extremely um, pleased to see some of the basic uh, tenets of their life's work being carried by us into uh, another generation. And I think that we don't do that out of any kind of nostalgia or any kind of formal respect. Rather, our respect comes out of the truth that that teaching has to offer. We're still, we're still operating from that. It's not a clinging to the past, but they're effective tools going forward. And I think that's the, the, the real difference. Um, Roger talked about teaching, and, uh, and that's a big part of the common ground, the shared territory that uh, David McCosh and Nelson Sanger had. And uh, it, they're, uh, I've always found them to be compatible, and the teacher even has a little more leeway in the freedom of exploring their work and using their work not as a product but as an experimental way of seeing proceeding than some, an artist who is making their living entirely from uh, selling paintings to a commercial world. So I think the artist potentially can use that. At the worst case scenario, I think academics retreat into a smaller world and kind of detach. But in the case of uh, Nelson and David McCosh, um, the world to which they, the larger world to which they kept returning is the, the landscape. So, um, years ago, fresh out of graduate school, 1978, Catherine and I came to Portland, and I was uh, hired as an adjunct at Portland State by Leonard Kimbrell, and uh, he was a curmudgeonly, good watercolorist, by the way, curmudgeonly department head, and um, a wonder, he ran wonderful meetings. I used to actually go to departmental meetings just to see them run by a person, because he ran it according to agenda. But he told me right away, he said, I'm not sure whether I'm doing you a favor or not. Don't think you can get on here just because I'm hiring. Because the fact that I'm hiring you part-time um, means that uh, you're not going to be full-time here. Right? So that was fair warning. It's really good uh, information. So I was under no illusions about that, but one of the people on the staff very nice to me was Craig Cheshire. That's where I met Craig Cheshire. And another fellow was Ray Grimm. Ray Grimm was a ceramist. Some of you may know his work. And uh, he asked me one day, I went to lunch with a bunch of people, and he said, well, you know, how's it going? I said, well, you know, I'm not sure they're getting the picture. I was teaching drawing. And he said, uh, well, why is that? What you? And, I said, and I explained to him the things I was getting to the class. He said, that's too much. He said, three things, give them three things a day, and that's it, three things is enough. And so I looked at my list of things to talk about with Makash and Sanger today, and I have seven things. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, great, they're not going to retain that, but I could bring it down to three and subsume those seven under three, and those three really are milieu and painting and teaching. And by milieu, I really mean that, um, uh, first of all, the Northwest. And that goes to subject matter and what they painted, and uh, there's a university milieu, an academic milieu. But I think on some profound level also, um, Nelson was a Chicago boy. His family moved to Chicago uh, when he was uh, five years old. So from the age five till age 15, they had to walk out of their house during the Depression, couldn't make the payments on it. They took whatever they could in a car and just shut the door on the house and came to Portland where my grandfather had worked through a relative in a furniture factory. That was the only work to be had. But Nelson's formative years were a city boy, as a city boy in Chicago, kind of a sickly city boy. And so one year in 1929, he's about uh, 11 years old, and I still have the journal, his grandparents took him on a car trip to the, uh, to the west, to California, because his grandfather was a farrier. He, he worked in, uh, worked in, uh, of the racetracks, and as a, as a kind of a regular Baptist guy, didn't smoke, didn't drink, uh, uh, people around the racetracks who don't uh, 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 drink and gamble are uh, known as reliable. <laughs> so, he, so he had work, depression notwithstanding. I mean, this is the era of Seabiscuit. Came out to California, and Nelson did as a 10-year-old with them, and got healthy, basket of apples by the door. Uh, landscapes, spaces between houses and the edges of the cities and all that, and that just completely changed his life. 
at the same so going back to Chicago then another few years they moved to Portland. And so he had that in common with David McCosh. They were they were they were they were Midwestern boys and they understood those those and Midwestern boys to whom the landscape here appealed as less populated and free and representing everything that the, you know the spirit that you see in these paintings, not just theirs but other people. So so that milieu is is really really important. And uh, you know Nelson came. Many of you know already. Nelson came to U of O on a baseball scholarship. He started at Linfield, and he met Bernard Geiser. And I think Geiser's the one who woke him up. Uh, Nelson's, Nelson's expectation of art, uh, his talent at drawing and things were recognized pretty early. But he put himself through school as a sign painter and his models were illustrators from magazines and James Montgomery Flagg and other people like that. And Geyser awakened Nelson to the world of fine art and the potentialities that, that, that image making could have. I think beyond that, uh, that, that, that uh, really more limited commercial realm that was his first exposure. So then, with baseball in mind, he comes to a bigger, better team here at, uh, at University of Oregon and meets McCosh and Vincent and later Wilkinson, and, 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 and that's the beginning of this thing. So I'm thinking, just to put that in perspective, and the, 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 the day's painting with Mark and Peg in perspective, is this is more than 70 years beyond the time that Nelson and, and, and David were first uh, meeting each other and beginning, beginning this exchange. So, uh, and then of course, so that that was the, I think there was a lot of admiration. Nelson did undergraduate work and then came back to university at, like a lot of people after the war, uh, finished up with a different attitude. People like Carl Hall saw the Northwest first, and Carl Hall's from Michigan, same story in a way, and being stationed at Adair, it was a, a, a miracle for him, this whole West Coast, and he vowed if he ever made it through that thing in the Pacific, that was his, that part of his war that alive, that he was going to come back to the Northwest, which he did. And so all these guys had, to, you know, all these people had that in, had that in common. So there's the, the, the academic milieu, I think, became a model for Nelson, too. And he told me that uh, Dave and Andy had recommended this job up at Oregon State, and he forgot to go the interview. And then when he did, <laughs> Dave chewed him out and said, well, you get up there. You know, so he said, I said, well, so you went up there? He says, yeah, I wrote up, I was just wearing a t-shirt, and he had his pack of cigarettes, you know, rolled up under his sleeve, you know, like people did. Then that's how he interviewed for the job of the state, that he then had 38, you know, if you have a job, he performed that job for 38 years. And uh, I think that maybe was he took another a very important point about their common ground was that Nelson took that uh, teaching seriously. So how do I know this stuff? I'm going to come back into your frame of view here in just a minute. I know this stuff through, I met Dave a couple of times, that's it, when I was in college and again in graduate school, and I talked to Mark and Peg a lot, talked to my dad a lot, and uh, I have uh, notebooks and, and things that are just, just, just wonderful. Um, keep, these are little assignments that Nelson would write for his class. And he would say, keep, some of it's in Spanish, pintura, titulo, mo, a full-blown cadenza. Sometimes you have a title before you had a painting. And uh, I'm just showing you this because, uh, uh, oh, here's another one. Here's a, a, a class list for a two-week watercolor class. And here's my mother's handwriting up here for Eric. You know, And so Nelson left me these things. Sometimes he'll say, for Eric, uh, or like this one, he'll say, keep. M.O. meaning my own idea, little arrow for Eric. Not because it's something that I should be doing, but because he knew I was interested in this. And uh, I'm thankful for the days before the computer. Now, what I am expected to do at my institution is uh, I start with notes like this, but I render everything into a standard college format, and I put it on the computer, and it's handed out as I'm required to do. And, and that's all fine, I think it's, it's, it's intellectually sound, but it's missing the spontaneous and handwritten quality that, uh, that I see in these, uh, in these notes right here. But uh, I've thought a lot about, you know, how do you make your way through an academic career, teaching, for teaching is some, 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 uh, some I mean, mostly, part of it's a joy and part of it is, uh, is very wearing. There's a cumulative wear and tear at the end of the year, at the end of the term. 
And uh, uh, I think I've, I've regarded it as a privilege to have a good job. Yeah, I've regarded it as a privilege, as Nelson did, as a privilege to have a role in an artist community of some kind as a teacher. But I think there's a very important difference between that I only realized in the last few years between an artist and a teacher. And that is that the teacher's job is fundamentally, uh, as I've understood it, partly to inspire, but you can't count on that. The teacher's job primarily is to make clear. And as an artist, you're really operating from a different center. You're really seeking to mystify or to preserve the mystery or to preserve a wonder, to, to preserve a, an enthusiasm. You're looking to evoke something that's dynamic that's not over-explained. And one of the things, and I think that this is, you know, by, it's a little to segue, uh, and it's important to keep those roles uh, straight. And I think one of the points of difference between Nelson and David is that they handled the teaching differently. And ultimately, Nelson came to assert quite uh, vigorously that all essential teaching was kind of done in between the lines, that it was essentially like a personal kind of insight and commentary. And I think uh, uh, David's uh, uh, exercises with, with, with color and with color mixing and things are, are really rather more formal than, than, than Nelson's teaching uh, often was. And he would have students go through that steps. But the big thing in common was the commitment to the job, the respect for the institution, you know, the respect for art, the place of art at an institution of higher education, and also something I think that's really, really important, and that is teaching fundamentals through specifics. Teaching fundamentals through specifics. So Mark and I and Peg and, 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 and the rest of us were, 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 were talking about some of the things that Mikash did. And Mark, Mark uh, observed that, uh, uh, that uh, as a student, that his fellow students would be doing wonderfully with the Mikash system. Of, of, of mixing colors and complementaries and, and, and doing things in bands and it's a very kind of a regulated series of exercises in the lower division painting courses. And then the student, same students would uh, get a good grade in the class and survive the class and go on and, and never do any of that again. <laughs> and so that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And that leads us to contemplate that the role of the teacher isn't always to be, it's, it, well, it's certainly not to get followers. That's not the goal. The role of the teacher is to stimulate people into doing their own work. Uh, and there are various sorts of ways of uh, doing that. And so one might be an effective teacher by laying out a program that a student tries on and then rejects. Absolutely. And uh, there's nothing personal in that. Well, there's something very personal in that, but the teacher's job is to give the students something to react against, and then how they, or with, or against, either way, and how they take that's entirely up to the student. So personally, I think what I, I respect, uh, I think the perfect attitude is what I would call the perfect attitude uh, for a student is respectful or affectionate even, affectionate skepticism. So there's a feeling there where you're free to take things up, and yet there's a feeling about, well, let's see about this. You know, I'll try it out for size, and, and we'll see how that works. But Umberto and I were talking about this wonderful watercolor painting earlier here. And uh, we admired um, the centrality of that. And uh, see it, we see it not as like a full-length portrait, but like a bust. Isn't that gutsy to walk up to a tree and just face it like that? And we are, of course, the way this part comes forward just aggressively and establishes this as a foreground, you don't even need to know exactly what it is, but you know where it is. And that's an important feature of that. And then early on, I'm wondering how early on, he was thinking about centrality when he did that, didn't he? Because this is pretty much equal to that. But then within that, right again, right in the middle, he's putting that down there. And then he takes that, which comes forward, this aggressive contrast bit, and shifts it off to the side. Isn't that fabulous? And so there's a visceral thing in that painting, this tension between symmetry and asymmetry. Fabulous. 
And of course, then, you know, one of the painter's bugaboos is you get, you get out in the forest, and of course this part of the forest is generally the same as that part of the forest, and the painter's struggling to see them different. So there's enough similarity between this side and this side so that you feel the continuity of the forest behind the tree. Without that, the tree wouldn't have its monument, monumental quality, and yet the color balance is different on this side than on that side despite the repeat of the colors. On average, it's different. And this occupies a different space. I feel that that's deeper, farther back than, than, than some of this. And so just our little conversation about that painting is really the kind of conversation that I think every painter in this room has with their work. It's a dialogue of work. It's not a single style. I was really intrigued by, uh, by Roger's um, beginning of a concept about uh, uh, a Northwest painting, or even you could say West Coast painting if you go down as far as the Bay Area. Los Angeles and its heavy urbanization is a different stylistic world. But there's something about the subject matter that represents common ground, of course. But beyond the subject matter, there's something that, that uh, I call and others call um, painter painting. <coughs> It's not a word that you find a lot of agreement on. It's kind of interesting. Some of the most important concepts we, we, we just really don't have good terminology for. I'll give you another example. We'll come back to painterly in a minute. Um, the word abstraction. And I noticed on that wonderful leaflet over there with a photograph. The photograph of David is by, a uh, leaflet is quite the wrong term, but that little trifold publication. The photograph is by Mary Ramblin. And she took that in the, in the 1970s. And uh, so that shows uh, David in his studio. But that leaflet of the title, that trifold of a brochure, uses the word abstraction. And I think that's a word that's a, you know, I don't mean to single-handedly try to, to uh, you know, change people's use of that word. But abstraction is used so loosely for so much. And I think that there's, so go ahead and let people use it the way you want. but but. But we lose an important concept if we don't recognize what abstraction really means. Abstract, to abstract means to take from. And so if you go to a librarian, if you're doing a research paper, and you, you, you need 20 sources, and you have, you find through your library, and you're in a library alone, you find 100 sources. You say, well, which ones am I really going to need here? I can't check them all out. It's too much. So you ask for abstracts. And what an abstract does is it gives you the essence of something in a very concise way. It is not the something, but it represents the essence of the something. And so I think that all these people that were all these paintings are truly abstract in the way, as distinct from, say, non-objective, which means no reference to the object. But in the world of art, you have subjective and objective and non-objective and and, uh, and representational, and, and you know, there are all these things that are kind of like swimming around with the or in subject matter as opposed to subject. This is confusing to students who are new to art. But I think that this concept of uh, the general concept and definition of abstraction is really important and represents a certain kind of painting. It's certainly different than even a camera, of course, abstracts. But the camera and photorealistic work abstracts very different things in a very different way than does the human eye. And so that's another really important element of, common, of, of, of the common ground here that I see in this work. And certainly something that, that Nelson took away from his uh, education at the University of Oregon and, uh, ran, and, and, and ran with his, uh, his entire life as a painter, this idea of, of abstraction. And some of it is kind of intuitive, and some of it is quite planned. And uh, there's a lot of sort of intellect that's applied. But another thing that, uh, I, I, apropos of the discussion that Umberto and I had about the picture, by the way, I don't pretend that we've exhausted that thing. You know, not for a second, but just in that kind of casual conversation, um, the thing that appealed to us most is looking through the subject matter, if you will, the tree and the duff in the foreground, the forest duff and the light and all that, looking through that into pictorial structure and qualities and having a conversation about it and developing a language in common, being able to talk and then analyze. 
And at the same time then, when you're in front of the subject matter as a painter, alone with your choices, alone with your materials, and alone with your sensations, then not having a specific uh, a, a list of agenda items to accomplish, but letting that subject matter speak through your technique and your discipline and your concepts. So um, there's a Roger mentioned earlier that two big Nelson oils in this room, one around the corner and one right in here. I hope you look at them later. And um, uh, uh, um, I mean, this came up, this painting in particular came up when um, uh, Roger and I were talking about points of difference between uh, Akash and Sandra. And uh, Roger said, well, you know, only Nelson could have done that painting. And it represents an interesting balance between a kind of dreamy, romantic surrealism and all the experience of a direct landscape, if you will, that, that combined in that painting. In a particular amalgam, he said only Nelson could do that painting. And it put me in mind of this wonderful statement by George Moore, who was a painter, more English painter, but more or less with the Impressionists. And he said, it does not matter that you paint badly. What matters is that you paint badly like no one else. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And in fact, if you really are completely honest with yourself, and one of the ways to be bad as a painter is to be affected or derivative. And so the whole question is, how do you, in what way do you, do you, do you learn from other people, and in what way do you teach uh, other people, so that you engender interpretations and not copies? And I think both Nelson and Dave, in their different ways, were very, very much um, concerned that that's what they do. They give people the strength of their of their own sensations and own convictions, and in meditating upon it, um, um, I think probably, and this is an inference rather than a quote or any other hard evidence. I think that was behind David Makash's insistence on subject matter for young painters that there be something that they work from that carries them away from themselves and away from their own processes and allows them to be a vehicle for observation. So the work from observation is really an important, uh, an important uh, feature to um, Akash's work and to Sangren's work. It's something they stayed there their whole lives. And it used to frustrate me endlessly as an undergraduate and even graduate student coming back talking with my father. One day I would hear oh, the subject matter doesn't matter, it's just a pretext, and the next day I would get a critique about a drawing or a painting where like, I didn't get the apple well enough. I said, how can you have it two ways? You know, and, it was a, and, it, and, and it's a long time before one, re, uh, in my case, before I realized that really how you, the way you define yourself as an artist isn't to pick one thing and go for it. That's too product oriented, you know. What you do is you define your poles, the polarities, and then you exist in this tension between sometimes opposing ideas. And you find yourself in your search between those two poles, not just in one place, but in the dynamic. And I think uh, that Matisse is very helpful uh, for, for artists at any age. I just read a new biography of Matisse and. Uh, and uh, because Matisse's poles were quite clear, he articulated them very well for himself. And so that leads me to another point of commonality that actually is a polarity with the way the human mind is constructed. We know now through physiology, the physiology of the last 30, 40 years, this was not a, a and even in the last 15, we know that the visual system of the brain processes line and completely different place than in, in, in your head, literally, then it processes color. Edge and outline and line are a different set of neurons. Right, they're beginning to separate where the information is, is coded for those separately right in the retina itself. And then it goes to a different part of the brain. And isn't it interesting how Makasha's mature work 
actually took those two different polarities and there's line work and there's color patches and he worked out those alternately alternately a little bit color and I was so interested in seeing and hearing about Mark's demonstration because I asked Mark you know, what did he do for you all I don't know how many of you were here to see that you know last week that's terrific and so he started from a sketch rather than a still life. And I asked him what he did. He says, step one, simplified sketch. Well, right there we're getting at the abstraction, right from the very beginning. It's, abstraction isn't something you arrive at. It's something that you begin with. And you make choices about what part of the story you're going to tell and what part of the story you're going to specify, what part of the story is a little vaguer, what part of the story doesn't need to be there at all. And then he lays down patches of color, separate patches of color. And after a while, then, then he, he begins to group those and regroup those with a skipping line. Not a solid line that's nailing everything down, but a skipping line. So the line itself can be in patches. And then into that relationship of line and color go other patches. So this was a Makash method. This is something that he, in a way, he codified and developed, especially during that uh, important period of his work that uh, Roger was talking about at Cohasset, which represented, oh, a number of things. It represented, I think, a deep understanding of the nature of painting, about the way we see. It represented a necessary break with the past. It represented the freedom from the academic obligations that he'd had and that were become building up on him. It represented all those things. It represented Makash's uh, uh, step forward into a, 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 a different world, I think, and this work is so exciting to us now. But, or I should say and, at the same time, although that method is particular to Makash, the underlying commonality with these other painters is that the painting is first of all a developing field of forces within the boundaries of the painting that you approach it not with a pre-digested idea of what it ought to look like in the end, but as an engagement in the moment, in the day, in the time, and the place. And that it needs to be an overall unity that like nature itself it hang together. This is not a widely held point of view in the world of art. This is something that's particular to this group of painters. And it's not unique to this group of painters, but it has, a it has a flavor. But it's a set of principles which is really defining. And I think it, defi it describes a lot of difference between conceptual, verbally, or verbal-oriented, word-oriented uh, art of various stripes. I won't say contemporary, <coughs> because that began with Dada and Duchamp and other people at the, you know, at the beginning of the century. It's been a while. But it's different, and it has, it has, of course, it's playing out today in all kinds of different ways. So I'm not judging it. I'm just saying I think that's really an important piece of the identity, is that the painting be a unity, and the painting be reactive, that it not be a foregone conclusion, and that it come out of these tensions between subject, meaning the painter, and the nature of the subject matter itself, that it come out of the difference between um, the, the line work and the color work and that it be subject to uh, interpretation in the, in, the, in the moment. So those are my big areas of common ground and um, I wanted to just uh, with respect to read you a little piece of a letter uh, that I thought was kind of interesting to reinforce Nelson's commitment to teaching. Um, this is um, written from Japan by Paul Gunn to Mark Sponenberg, who is the head of the department. Its date is 1984. So this is rather near the end of Nelson's career. I think he retired in 86, is that right? And uh, so Gunn writes, uh, the periodic review of Professor Sangren smacks of the giant reviewed by pygmies. <laughs> There's a compliment. <laughs> There's something distasteful about it, but since it's the rule of the university, I'll get on with it. Nelson's been my colleague, mentor, and friend. We've drunk a few pints together for 36 years. I know him well. There's no one at the university whom I respect more. Uh, 
you know, I, this is a really polite letter. I wish I had a letter like this. <laughs> I have some pretty good ones. When I was in England, um, I had a letter in response. I asked them to write a letter about my, about my uh, performance there. And uh, they disagreed with my, uh, my um, meritocratic and democratic American roots. And they had the, one paragraph said, has interesting ideas about marking. <laughs> marking would be great. <laughs> You know, so you know that's 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 uh, you know it's one thing to think you've done a good job. It's another thing for your colleagues to know that you've uh, you, you, you've done a, a, a good job. And I think uh, Dave and, and uh, Andy and uh, Wilkinson, Jack Wilkinson, were all terrific models for Nelson, and he took those models forward into his career and stayed true to that the whole time. How is uh, Nelson's work different than David Mukacha's? In what way did he go his own way? Um, uh, I think that uh, it was very encouraging me for a few years ago to, for, um, for uh, Roger Sadak to observe that some of his uh, favorite work of Nelson's represented this kind of imaginary interiority. And I think we really see that in both of these oil paintings. A lot of people think of Nelson primarily maybe as a watercolorist. And we're seeing that on the other side here in that beautiful response to the freshness of the day. But in Nelson's sketchbooks and in those little, those little things that he never overworked that represent sort of dreams and memories and imagination, there's a kind of a moodiness that is different. And almost, uh, if you had to classify it, I think you'd call it a romantic strain if you relate it to something earlier in the history of art. And so I think Nelson went much more that way while always being tempered and enlivened and refreshed by this return to, uh, to direct observation. Um, uh, perhaps I didn't emphasize as a commonality enough the nature of drawing and the fluidity of drawing. I think that's sort of tied in with the observation and it may be obvious. Um, but in relationship to that, um, I think Makash became after that period in, in, in Cohasset, very, in very important respects, what, uh, for want of a better word, I'd call a field painter. And all overfloating of patches and elements, you know, that unify the entire picture surface. And Nelson was very, well, to the end of his life, very, you know, kind of preoccupied with designing shapes, very definite shapes. And uh, so I think there's a little difference in personnel, not that there aren't, patches in Nelson's painting, and not that there aren't, you know, shapes in Makashi's painting, but that tends to be a, a, a kind of a difference. I think Nelson was fundamentally uh, a more gregarious person than David Makash was. And so a lot of his work has to do with figures in the landscape, with engaging figures, with a lot more portraiture, uh, and things like that. And, and so that was a natural difference between them that just couldn't help but express itself in paint and therefore in the quality of, uh, of, the, of the earth. Uh, the approach to teaching, I think uh, David McCosh was probably more controlled and more exercise oriented uh, than Nelson. Nelson was spontaneous and as I said, had a great belief in sort of teaching between the lines. They also had a very different response to the surface of the painting. And uh, just uh, uh, David's paintings are, are frugal and, and very often very thin. That's quite a different example over there. And um, uh, Nelson's favorite painter was uh, the French painter Rouault. And he related to me, he liked that slab, that slabbed oil surface. He related it to the crusty snow of his uh, Manitoba, Canada youth. You know, that snow underfoot. I mean, he just had a good feeling about those, those accrued surfaces. And then he was, so he piled on the paint and then he learned uh, from C.S. Price about scraping. And uh, he was very proud of the fact that he would scrape off the day's work frequently and leave it as a pile of paint on the easel and then go back and put more on. And uh, one of the important aspects of Makasha's work, we talked about it this last weekend, and it's something that uh, I've resolved, I think it's so important, I've resolved to bring it to a, a more conscious level in my work for the summer, just to integrate it even better. 
is there is in uh, both water Makash watercolors and um, oils, there is a very careful um, a juxtaposition of opaque passages and translucent patches, passages to the paint. And I think it's a very special thing, and it's a very subtle thing. Um, I was Joseph Albert's work-study student when I was an uh, undergraduate at college. He had uh, retired, but they needed somebody from the library, and they chose me. I thought it was just a great experience. So I've been to his workspace and his office and his, study, and his studio. Uh, 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 just on the on the outskirts of Connecticut, and uh, you know, Albers, of course, is the originator of the color courses, which are pretty have been codified and taught all over America. And uh, really, there's very little attention in those particular courses to the quality of color that I find in the Makash paintings. It's the difference. Imagine you have an orange of a particular intensity and a particular hue. And then you have those matched, opaque and translucent, adjacent, immediately adjacent to each other. And that's not part of the hue value intensity thing. It's really a very, it may be, you know, there's a little talk about luster uh, as a quality, but that's not quite either. And so, um, uh, Makash is really quite regular and structured about his use of that. And I think you'll find the same thing in Nelson's painting, but it's a lot more spontaneous, a lot more active. But Nelson was, was always engaging in one of these polarity things between scumbling, which is opaque paint, skipping over the surface, you're leaving a little stuff coming through, and glazing, which is generally with dark, rich color, no white, and establishing transparencies, which might be then scumbled over. So that dialogue between uh, between scumbling and glazing is something that you see highly ordered in Makash paintings and you see it frequently in Sanger paintings in a much less orderly way. Um, years ago I did a little presentation, or we did a presentation, with Nelson and I had a, a, a two-person show at the Corvallis Art Center. And he spoke about my work a little bit and I spoke about his work. And uh, John Byrne uh, came up to me afterwards, he said, boy you nailed that one right. He, he said, you really nailed it when you said that there are two kinds of, 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 of baseball players at the plate, two kinds of hitters. And one of them is, would be exemplified by Ted Williams, or, or you'd say Barry Bonds, you know, before he got ran into his drug problem. And that is extremely selective, scientific, wouldn't swing at a bad pitch. Had exactly described, had a lot of theories about how to hold the bat and what the mechanics of the swing are. Great, you know, great ball. And then you have Yogi Berra. He would swing at anything. <laughs> Just as fine a hitter, but a free swinger. I describe Nelson as a free swinger. <laughs> so, so, so I think uh, in a lot of ways with respect especially to, to, the, um, uh, to the juxtaposition of transparent and opaque, uh, and it's not just with white, by the way. Dave used these, like these Indian, the Indian red is an opaque color. Sometimes yellow ochre can be, when you use it, can be an opaque color. So it's not just with white. And this opacity occurs at different levels. So it's just one of the treats of, uh, one of the uh, treats of this painting. So um, there are my points of similarity and, and, and difference. I would like to, just two other, Two other things to mention, I think, that, that, that maybe have to, they overlap with the Mu and background, is, uh, is they, uh, both David and Nelson had uh, uh, worked in watercolor and oil, sometimes a, later Nelson in acrylic and uh, printmakers. So they had these different media in common that were important to their production, and they allowed one medium to comment on their efforts in another. I think it's one of those polarity things that keeps an artist animated. Uh, it's not necessary, but it certainly works for some people. And uh, I think Nelson got from Dave a certain appetite for working in scale in murals. And uh, you know, I'm happy to have inherited some of that experience and find my own ways to do that. But uh, Nelson always credited Roger Sadak with the prime mover of getting him to do these uh, mail and sweep murals out here at the airport. And um, that was so important to him, not only just as a larger place to work, but as a kind of fulfillment of an ambition that I think he inherited from, from David. David was 
as I understand, he was out here for a few years or a year, then had to go back to Washington, D.C. to complete his large-scale murals in the Department of the Interior. But he did others, too. And if you are ever en route between Eugene and Seattle, uh, not, or you could come visit us in Aberdeen, um, stop at Kelso. And in the post office at Kelso is a mural that is roughly the size of this white wall up here at the center of the room, a little shorter maybe. It's a Native American first contact kind of scene. It's a large mural by David McCosh. And in there you can discern, although it's very much in the style, you can see Dave had his own period of apprenticeship as a student and working in the style of the WPA. But still you can discern in passages of that the makash that we know from this wonderful selection of work here. So I hope I've said some things that have stimulated you or even ticked you off a little bit. And, uh, and I'd like to hear about them. And uh, um, say that. Oh, I do have one other thing. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Mark and I just laughed and laughed about this because we said every time we paint together, he said, "Now, Mark, what was Makasha's palette again?" Here's the case, and I must in Nelson's notebooks. I have maybe 200 of Nelson's notebooks, and maybe 50 times I have Makasha's palette listed, which means, of course, that he didn't remember from one time <laughs> to another. You know, uh, and so this is uh, this is a little this is a little sample. You know, of Nelson working out those colors, and there they are listed on the back, and it's signed <laughs> Nelson Sangren, 1964. No black, no blues, just in case you hadn't noticed. You know, and I think there's a lot to be said about this palette and about palettes. And Nelson is interested in palettes and the selection of palettes uh, his whole life. I think part of the milieu that they shared is the Depression era, frankly. And I think that becomes something, it's not a place really, but it's a state of mind that you carry around with you. So there's something delightful about making, it's really essential to art, about making a lot out of a little. And in fact, Albers would say, ah, uh, he said that, a measure of art is the discrepancy between physical fact and psychic effect. <laughs> So, I mean, that's so, in his epigrammatic style, that was so, that's really profound. In other words, the difference, the measure of art is how much you get from how little. And so the frugality of Makash, literally frugal, right, the Scots became Scotch, you know, applied to that palette, and Nelson would take it further and say, okay, this is my palette, not even a blue either here. This is a Sangrin, Sangrinian version going back to Hulse of the, of, you know, so if you mix the black with the white, you get a gray, which in the context of these other warm colors becomes bluish. That's your blue. So that a sense of economy that I think he exhibited, that, that these two Midwestern Depression era figurative painters experienced together was something that stayed with them and formed their paintings for a very long time. So I have just one other thing to bring out of the bag. So I have this on my wall in, in, in uh, this, my studio in Portland. Okay. So on the back there's a note, and it says, uh, this is 1994, Corvallis, Oregon. This keepsake given me by painter friend Mark Clark. It is one of David McCosh's palettes. He was one of the USA's finest painters. David was trained at the Chicago Art Institute, later helped train many painters at the U of O. I love train. <laughs> Eugene, where I studied with him, he was a fine teacher also, and an enduring inspiration. The palette was artfully mounted and given to me in this form by Robert Irwin. So this is the talisman. <laughs> and I was telling Mark, I just, uh, I just read that uh, uh, one of Pierre Matisse's contemporaries in Paris in the 19, late 1920s or early 30s had a show of nothing but painters' palettes, 30 different painters put the paint and didn't label them and offered a prize to the person who matched up the, 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 the painter with the palette and Jacques Lipschitz won. <laughs> But there are some days, of course, when the palette looks better to the painter than the painting in front of him or her. 
And uh, that's just to be expected because this painting is a business fraught with choices and history and, uh, and difficulty. And, and so we're just love to celebrate uh, with you a gallery that has brought so much of this to uh, our view. So thank you, Karen. <laughs> So Peg is standing in front of the place where I really knew I could be a painter for the first time, that right there at Yachts. I was painting with Nelson, we set up an easel, and this bird flew by, I told I just was astounded at this event, I can't hardly explain it to you, except this bird, I had this, that scene more or less underway, and this bird flew across it, and I grabbed a rag because I thought that white paint had spilled on my painting. <laughs> and I told my father about that confusion. He said, that's it, that's it. That's how you know you're a painter. <laughs> when, you're, when your interior world and the exterior world have so conflated, you know, that, that you're totally with it. So that was, my, that was my sign. So it's just particularly nice to see that beautiful Cheshire painting. So, okay. uh, comments, Thank you questions? Very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'll give you a couple concise answers. I had the good fortune of going very far away to school. I applied to Fairhaven College, Western Washington University, Oregon, Yale College, and uh, I didn't. I really didn't have any idea what I was doing. And I just, at the last minute, I just somebody placed on spring vacation of 1971. They put down a placemat in front of me over at the Ahats restaurant, and it was a Long Island Sound. So I turned to my mother and said, well, looks like I'm going to hate them. And she was pleased. I had no idea what a great art department I would find in there. I found an art department that was totally devoted to drawing and uh, the development of, your, of an individual sensation through the picking of artistic heroes and working that out uh, fluidly in drawing and painting on canvas. And so then that went to graduate school. So that's one with a huge admixture of art history at a place where things were available. So, I mean, in this context, I'm kind of seen as Nelson's son. In that context, I'm a struggling student, intimidated by um, an incredibly talented student body, and I found something that other people thought I was good at. So that was my beginning of my reinvention, that's part of it. And so ultimately, without answering all the technical questions, um, Nelson advised me when I went away to graduate school, he said, you're going to find a lot of pressure against doing watercolors in particular and against working from life. That's just the way graduate schools are now. He said, you know, you'll find your own way with that, but I just want to tell you that that's been a hugely important part of my life. So I listened to that. And I was doing watercolors and they were panning me at Cornell until Janet Fish came to my defense. I, Janet Fish was a guest artist there. She's a photo, you know, I mean, she actually not photo, just still life. They, they look like they're from photos, but. So she came, so I had some signal moments like that. And then in the long run, I have taken what I think is my father's uh, interest in this interior aspect of painting. And I have turned it to a mythic aspect. And it's not something that I've shown very much in Eugene in this context. But a lot of my work has to do with what I call the mythic Northwest. And thanks to trips with Dee and uh, her husband Paul on their boat up to Alaska, I feel that my work kind of starts here and really looks to the north. And so uh, it's that combining of, of, of elements, even symbolic elements, in the images. That where I find uh, I'm, I'm kind of mining the same vein 
but with enough difference to not feel anxious about it. So thank you for the question. Questions or comments about Dave's work or Nelson's work or anything here? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.